the first principle, I'll mention, these are known to many of you, but they are kind of best baseline. I'll mention them briefly. The basic, basic principle is milieu of control, which means controlling all communication or attempting to in any environment. And then the second principle is what I call mystical manipulation, hidden maneuvers uh, uh, behind the scenes. Uh. Third, a demand for purity, the vision of the world into pure good and pure evil. control of the his or her guilt and shame mechanisms, and there's no greater control that one can achieve over another human being. Another principle is that of the sacred science. These groups are not content to claim absolute spiritual truth, but must combine it with what they take to be absolute scientific truth. Uh, there is what I call the loading of the language, a rhetoric and a language that only permits the claims of the particular group to be expressed. Alternative claims are blocked out by the very language. Uh, there's another principle, that of doctrine over person. It's very obvious, uh, but not when you're in the middle of it. And that is that any doubts or any critical feelings that one's accurate personal perceptions inform one about are attributed to one's own shortcomings, turned back on one. And that's, again, another uh, control of guilt and shame. And then uh, one has to embrace the doctrine rather than one's personal uh, discoveries. Finally, the most uh, dangerous dimension of cultic behavior, what I call the dispensing of existence. And that really means that cultic groups so embellish their own claim to absolute truth that they divide the world into those who have a right to exist and those who have no such right. Now, uh, that may be just symbolic in many ways in terms of favors or whatever, but it can become much more dangerous and even murderous. Most people need proof. They need something tangible in their hands, some kind of real validation, or they need to see something working to prove that it's possible. And, and you know, we can look at the Wright brothers in their airplane. Yeah, almost everybody thought that was a load of crap until the bird was flying in front of them, and then they went, "Holy shit!" <laughs> and then, and then all of a sudden, we have an airline industry. But we need to create. That holy shit moment, and I can think of no better way. I mean, this is this is kind of pie in the sky and kind of funny and tongue in cheek in a way, but you know, world hunger solved by the United Nations 
with the help from the Venus Project. You know, I mean, if we can get something like that, you know, world hunger solved by Venus Project, you know, thank you with the help of the United Nations. But really using Venus Project methodology to solve the actual problem, that will be huge in proving ourselves. Especially, I mean, even if it's not totally solving world hunger, but I don't know, saving a million people's lives a year or a month or whatever, you know, some crazy statistic that shows, yeah, we built this one building and um, the neighboring 15 villages now have food for life, or at least for the next 50 years because the building is pretty robust, uh, you know, and the only thing that would hamper the building or the food would be some nefarious organization coming in and attacking it. And then if they did that, then it's per, it's very obvious that that organization or those people are absolutely not concerned in any way, shape, or form with actually helping people eat. They only want to maintain their power and control, and that's when you go in and just simply annihilate them. Um, that's where I do advocate military force a little bit. If we build these really cool facilities that are passive and peaceful and feeding people, and some organization comes in and tries to destroy it or does destroy it, that organization needs to be completely just eradicated from the face of the planet because that is pure evil. Absolutely. I don't, I don't care what their ideology is. At some point, people need to die. And if they're that bad, if they're going to destroy a robotic food farming facility that's saving the lives of thousands of children and they do something to it, they need to be destroyed. No questions, no jury, no, no – you're gone. Toast. You are a useless – waste of skin. Further information provided in an ABC interview with Jared Loeffner's best friend has shed new light on his worldview and what may have contributed to his explosion of violence on that dark day. Loeffner began abusing alcohol and drugs, specifically a drug called salvia, a natural and legal hallucinogen that he thinks Loeffner may have been using while taping this video. He would say he was using it and he would talk about it and say like what it would do to him. As for motive in Saturday's attack and the speculation Loeffner may have been fueled by partisan politics and rhetoric in the media. He did not watch TV. He disliked the news. He didn't listen to political radio. He didn't take sides. He wasn't on the left. He wasn't on the right. Instead, he points to this online documentary series called Zeitgeist as the gas on Loeffner's fire. It's a documentary movement that rails on currency-based economics. I really think that this Zeitgeist documentary had a profound impact upon Jared Loeffner's mindset and how he viewed the world that he lives in. Eventually, Jared's bizarre behavior drove Osler away. We learn more about the Zeitgeist movement from their website and a glowing profile on the Huffington Post. The Zeitgeist movement is a utopian atheistic movement to abolish world currencies, rise above politics and national borders, get beyond traditional and organized religion, and even go further than Marxism to structure a new global system to a place of harmony among all people. The Huffington Post says concerning their abolition of currency... It will indeed take a restructuring of the mind for those unfamiliar with Fresco's work to realistically accept the ideas he proposes of a new global society that has given up money and property in favor of a shared, sustainable, technology-driven community. The caustic skepticism can already be heard, critics crying out with pointed fingers, decreeing communism, socialism, insanity. But as Fresco himself will tell you, communism is still just another system with banks and social stratification. The kind of world he imagines for the future is much different. Their site, under the heading of spirituality, declares, The idea of praying to a god for a particular request has also statistically proven to have little effect on an outcome, not to mention the evidence to support a personified creator doesn't exist in any scientific way. Rather, it is often derived from ancient historical literary speculation and tradition. To distinguish themselves from those who are concerned with a new world order, they clarify their position on this topic. There is a large movement of people who constantly talk about the New World Order. This, of course, is true to a certain extent, but the failure of awareness is that this group is not a group at all. It is a tendency. The Zeitgeist Movement's adherents have joined both large leftist rallies that were held in D.C. last year, Ed Schultz's One Nation Rally and John Stewart's Restoring Sanity Rally. There has not been any documentation produced of the Zeitgeist Movement attending any Tea Party or Sarah Palin rallies. 
the characteristics of a dangerously violent cult of this kind. Uh, it doesn't mean that every cult that shows any of these characteristics fits into this category of a murderous cult or a violent cult, but it does mean that if you have most of these characteristics, we should look out and beware. Uh, the first characteristic is, what it, is the totalized guruism that I mentioned, which becomes paranoid guruism, megalomanic guruism, a, a very absolute kind of guruism. Uh, second, an apocalyptic event or series of events that destroys the world in the service of renewal. But more than that, the ide ideology of making that happen, of forcing the end, some poetic ideology, so that one helps it to happen. And then a characteristic that I call the relentless impulse toward world, world rejecting purification. The world is evil and polluted and must be rejected and destroyed in a very different way. Heaven's Gate felt that way in its mass suicide. We, we should distrust anybody with excessive hatred for the world. So what do we do about this? Well, there's no simple formula, but one very strong principle, which people in this room are very aware of, is to be wary of any group or person who claims the only or the complete truth. Uh, as Albert Camus has written, he who does not know everything cannot kill everything. It's in the claim to absolute knowledge uh, that the murderous processes can be nurtured. It is important to keep in mind also that cultic totalism and apocalyptic violence are by no means the only paths available to us and that our own more protean sensibilities can create alternative attitudes and actions. Again, that's what I think uh, this group stands for. Uh, alternative sources of life power and larger human connectedness that uh, require not the status quo rigidities, but rather continuous imaginative efforts to locate ourselves in a confusing world and not to become superhuman as these cultic groups promise uh, and, and claim to become, uh, but rather as beings who do not seek to become superhuman, but rather to sustain our own humanity. a matter of brainwashing with thought reform. Of course, thought reform is an important pattern, uh, but there is a, an attraction to the guru uh, in the name of this perfect vision so that the guru can convey something that we call charisma. People always talk about charisma, but nobody seems to know exactly what it is. It does mean an enormous attraction that some people have, and it has to do, I think, with two psychological dimensions. One is a person with charisma can convey to others the promise of radically new meaning in one's life and new vitality, and a, an equal promise of belonging to something eternal, some eternal spiritual principle. So it's both vitality and immortality, and that's a rather powerful combination. Uh, we can never explain a guru's actions totally by what we know of his or her childhood, but we do want to learn what we can about that childhood. But uh, no adult of any kind is a mere product of his childhood. If we think of the self as constantly in motion, and most of our uh, psychological approaches involve a sense of the self, uh, then we know that it's constantly changing and is never totally predictable from childhood. Uh, nonetheless, a guru tends to feel that he or she has discovered some ultimate human truth and must convey it to the world. A guru can be both convinced of his truth and also a con man at the same time. The two don't eliminate. One doesn't eliminate the other. That was very much the case with many gurus that, that we know of. How do I explain to people that this is not being, this notion is not being brainwashed? 
Well, the notion of incentive, as I said before, is really living well and having a society that supports you. No crime, no debt, extreme less stress. You know, getting what you need, you grow, you explore, you develop, you flourish. That is the incentive. Unfortunately, people can't even, can't even see that. Um, as far as brainwashing, uh, you know, everything is brainwashing. I hope everyone understands. So the visions become addictive, and you must take that into account when you consider the power of cults. It's not just a matter of brainwashing or thought reform. Of course, thought reform is an important pattern, uh, but there is a, an attraction to the guru uh, in the name of this then perfect we vision. Next level. How do we utilize resources in the most efficient way? Technology is the methodology to harness uh, any type of resources we have. Technology is the growing intellectual field that allows us to know how to manipulate our environment for our betterment and to be more sustainable, hopefully. So what we do is we utilize our technical information and then we analyze the planetary resources. Then we build from the ground up an entire infrastructure not based on the whims of any type of ideology, capitalist, socialist, fascist, uh, whatever, what have you, communist. You do it based explicitly on the most efficient means to do it with the most peak efficiency possible based on the technology available at the time, the intellectual resource of the time. You have peak efficiency and sustainability as your goal. You just simply weigh all parameters when you analyze anything and then you're going to build a society that is essentially, for lack of a better expression, perfect. It's not perfect at all because things are going to constantly change, but it's the best you can do at that point in time, which I think would be a, a variance of perfection. Everyone's brainwashed, one way or another. It's either you're brainwashed for good, you're brainwashed for bad. We'll use a better term in conditioning. What you're doing is educating people. See, that's the whole zeitgeist movement that the New York Times promotes. A computer will decide where you work, where you live, and what you do, and we'll all live in big communal buildings. That sounds like prison, doesn't it? It is, but it's, see, if you say it with long hair, you talk real soft and condescending and lisping, and fake intellectual, and then do, Alex, if you don't agree, you'll be sent to a re-education camp. And then later the guy, you know, Peter Joseph, comes back and says, I'll come on your show if you apologize for saying, I said you'd be re-educated. And I went back and watched the interview and he said, you'll be sent for re-education. He went on the phone, he goes, I never said that. We know the truth. Yes, two plus two equals whatever you say, because you talk with a condescending voice. Uh, it's when they can no longer control their environment that they may lapse into paranoid psychosis or paranoid schizophrenia. The psychiatrist movement knows nothing. I'm saying, how would it be any effect with any other movement? The psychiatrist movement has no blueprint, no plan. There we go. We got about. Oh, hi. Sorry, we're running a little bit late. Uh, excuse me a sec. Hey, Bob, make fast. Sorry, man. Earth. Curious little ball of rock, gas, and water, isn't it? Hard to believe this little bubble of chemical elements floating in space, basically powered by the sun, could give rise to our colorful yet rather troubling super monkey species. I know how to get a free suit. All I have to do is go to Macy's, get a suit, charge it, and then when the bill comes, rip it up. Ethical issues aside, you see the main problem with this approach is that I can only do it once. The next time I go to Macy's, they'll know, because they made a note of it last time, that I rob suits and they won't give me another one. But I have a clever idea. I'll go to Penny's and get a free suit there. But hang on. When I try to get my free suit from Penny's, they won't give me one either. Macy's has told them that I'm a suit thief. That's odd. One view of the marketplace is that it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world of hostile competitors. Excuse me a second. Bob, what the hell was that? The cutaway. It wasn't funny. It was just depressing. Couldn't you have found some guy shooting a bottle rocket out of his ass or something? Well, I think so. Well, 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 well. I mean, you know what our demographic is and the point of this show, right? Okay, well, please. Anyway. <laughs> so coming back to our household, the Earth. 
What is this thing really? It's a system. It's a system of symbiotic laws. And at the core of all principles of sustainability is recognition of the largest order system we can find. For reference, the price mechanism on the Bob, what was that? Jesus Christ, Louie. Bob, why didn't you tell me Louie was here already? Oh, what's up? Oh, right. Mm. You see, the myth of this system is that people get what they work for, as though it's a level playing field, as though the competitive nature doesn't inherently breed corruption. Wrong! Oh, man. Bob, what's he doing here? So what kind of bullshit is Peter Joseph Stalin feeding you people this episode? <laughs> listen, uh, man. Listen, people. What Captain Freedom Hater over here doesn't seem to understand is that the poor are fucking stupid. They're stupid and lazy, and they get what they deserve, all right? And I'm so sick of the nanny state coming in and taxing my hard-earned trust fund so these cretins can go and live it up with their lottery tickets and their malt liquor. <laughs> Sorry, Bob. You all right? Put him back in his cage. Where's the credit scene? What? What do you mean Bob didn't get hurt? I'm sorry, Bob. It's the format of the show. You see, the greatest threat to any political establishment is... What? What do you mean? This? This is a platform. It's three dimensionals. There's the base. Yeah, I know it's not very good. Fuck off, Bob. Don't, don't make me shoot you again. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but Bob is officially dead. As far as the DVD sales, if people can't respect the fact that I charge $5 for DVDs that could be charged $20 for, that I did spend a great deal of money to make those films, the DVD sales obviously are part of my income. Peter Joseph has asked us to stand out here in the freezing cold and talk about the difference of classes here, but you know, he's sitting in like his LA loft, like relaxing with like his big, you know, flat screen TV. Joseph are you making a living uh, doing lectures now like what are you doing for... I have never been paid for a lecture I make a modest living trying to commercially now exploit zeitgeist and occasionally I believe it or not I still do some equity things and we do what we have to do in this system but I so you're have... out there scamming the people and finally the whole thing is packaged in a science a claim of there's extreme technocratic manipulation. There's a, a claim of scientific validity. This movement is about social awareness and advocation of fluid evolutionary progress, both personal, social, technological, and spiritual. If you go back to the Charles Manson cult in 1969, of course we know that Manson was a criminal thug, but he was also an apocalyptic figure, a Christ figure in his own eyes and that of his disciples, who had the idea of an activist Armageddon, and Manson would then rule. See, the games that you guys play with your woman and man thing, we don't play that man-woman thing. You, know, you guys are all hung up in them soap operas, they're killing themselves over crazy things that really, you know, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't mean anything. When, when you peak the peak and you touch the ultimate, then you walk with the ultimate in your soul forever, man. You know, and you can't put a personality on that. You can't say, well, I'll now pronounce you man and wife, you know, and all that thing that was somewhere else, because the rebirth movement that I started, don't go back and pick up the same old shit. Excuse my French. You do go back and pick up the same old trash can. You start all over. Uh, Jones was in initially uh, a social activist who believed in racial harmony and tried to bring it about. 
The Reverend Jim Jones was preaching from the pulpit at the People's Temple in San Francisco. His followers, mostly poor black men and women, gave Jones their money and their loyalty. Just ask me your questions and I'll tell you right straight from the shoulder where I stand. Jones said he stood for social and economic equality, a utopian society, a utopian society, a utopian society. If you think about Manson or Jim Jones, they were both very sensitive about nuclear weapons. Jim Jones, as you know, changed the locale of his church, which group a couple of times, largely because he thought that the new locale would be safer in the nuclear war that was expected. But neither Manson nor Jones imagined possessing nuclear weapons. They saw themselves as victims. After living with nuclear weapons for half a century, and they're uh, becoming uh, more technologically advanced and miniaturized, we can now, in small groups, can imagine possessing them. And I call this uh, the trickle-down effects of nuclear weapons, or trickle-down nuclearism. It's the only Reagan term I ever used. <laughs> We might move into disarmament projects, anti-militarism projects. This is where phase two comes into play. It's basically an expansion of the team, the expansion of the group focuses, and basically making an organization as such through the interconnection of these different groups with interrelated focuses. Interdisciplinary is a good word. You reveal the surprising fact that Charles Manson, Jim Jones, Marshall Applewhite, Asahar, etc., based their actions in part on the belief that the world would come to an end in the year 2000. With this in mind, does the passing of the millennium next year hold out hope for the frequency of murderous suicidal cults will decrease? Well, uh, it's very hard to predict. Uh, one should avoid being a prophet like them, so to speak. But uh, what I think about all this is that there was much too much media focus on the moment of the new year, the new millennium, whether it's this new year or the next new year, according to how you calculate it and not enough focus on more thoughtful or reflective uh, approaches to what is going on in this cult of behavior. What I try to say, all too briefly perhaps, or uh, in ways that may not have been fully clear to you tonight. So I think that uh, the cultic problem is going to be with us and probably will explode in unexpected ways. Uh, yes, we should feel some relief that nothing happened uh, at the turn of the millennium, but that's no guarantee that certain things will not happen, and, and uh, we have to study it, we have to continue our educational practices and be wary. This is Jack Fresco's failed 1974 prediction. Afraid to live in the society we live in today. The direction we're moving in gives us 25 years for a total environmental destruction. We have seven years to mass starvation. We don't have much time. Insufficient. Dignified, ascetic, empathic, supportive, wise, spiritually genuine, innovative, pragmatic, but also childish, inconsistent, fraudulent, manipulative, gluttonous, promiscuous, exploitative, duplicitous, grandiose, schizoid, paranoid, delusional, megalomanic, and murderous. Well, that's a very long list. <laughs> I don't know whether you'd see it through and listen to it. But the point is that the self can be very complex and can have many different components. And that's one source of some of the strength of these gurus. They can be those positive elements to many people who feel that in them. And they, at the same time, have all those dangerous and negative elements. Uh, and, and that's really very important to understand in relation to cultic behavior. A lot of New Age American influence which went into this.